Welcome to the Savvy Painter Podcast, the podcast for artists who mean business. Here's your host, Antrice Wood. Hello, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. I am super excited to have Carol Maureen as my guest this week. But before we dive into the episode, I wanted to mention a few things that are going on. If you've been listening to the show, you know that although I record and produce the Savvy Painter from Argentina, where I live with my husband, I'm originally a Southern California girl. In just four weeks, my husband and I are closing up shop here and going to California for three whole months. We are both beside ourselves with excitement. This is our once a year trip back home to see my family and friends. In addition, I have a solo show of the paintings I created for my project, A Portrait of Argentina. Of course, there's a bit of planning to do. I'm finishing up some extra paintings, cataloging the work, and making an inventory of the list for the gallery. To be honest, that's to help me keep my sanity. But the gallery loves that I'm doing it. I'll be talking a lot more about the preparations at the beginning of the next few episodes, so you can follow along if you're interested and know how I plan for a show. Today, for example, I got word that we got permission to do a paint out at the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens. I grew up in Claremont and the Botanic Gardens was one of my favorite places to explore as a kid. I have very fond memories of riding my bike over there with my friend Sarah. The Botanic Gardens has the largest garden dedicated exclusively to California native plants. We're finalizing the date, but it's going to be the second or third week of March. So if you're in California and interested in meeting up for a paint out, the details and sign up will be on SavvyPainter.com. I'm also going to start a Google Hangout for Savvy Painter listeners. We'll start by doing it just once a month, and then we'll see how it goes. Next Friday, January 30th, will be the first one. It'll be 45-minute Q&A. Sign-ups are, where else? On SavvyPainter.com. So that's enough housekeeping. Did I mention that Carol Maureen is with us today and I'm excited about that? So a month or so ago, Carol wrote on her blog that she's been listening to the podcast while she paints. I immediately got an email saying, hey, Carol mentioned your show on her blog. And by the way, why haven't you interviewed her yet? Excellent point. I'm always open to your suggestions. So I reached out to Carol and she graciously agreed to be on the show. Now, if you're not familiar with Carol and her work, you may remember that in episode number 18, Dwayne Kaiser and I talked about his strategy of painting a postcard-sized painting every day and offering it up for sale on eBay. Carol Maureen is someone who has taken that idea, run with it, and has cultivated a community of artists dedicated to the daily painting practice. Carol has a degree in art and has sold her work in galleries, but after she and her husband adopted their son, She went through an evolution. She started painting daily while her newborn napped and eventually found that short spurts of painting time was more liberating than constraining. Not long after, she and her husband started a website called Daily Paintworks, an online gallery where artists post their daily paintings and sell them at auction. What started as a 12-member site in 2007 today has blossomed to over 1,400 members. Carol recently published a book called Daily Painting, Paint Small and Often to Become a More Creative, Productive, and Successful Artist. It's my pleasure to welcome Carol Marine to the show. Carol, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Do you remember if there was a particular painting that you were especially proud of when you did it? Actually, and I think that this is really common to all artists. And I think it's why we keep painting is because we have those interspersed with all the hard ones. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us motivated. And so, sure, I I can remember a number of paintings that I just loved at the time. And, and, And a lot of them I still love to this day. It's so funny because one day I was out in my studio. This was, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so. I was out in my studio and and I had been going through kind of a real rough week maybe where nothing was really working out like I thought it should. And finally I did one that was just, you know, it painted itself basically. And I came in from my studio and I said to my husband, oh, (laughs) now I remember why I love painting so much. And he said, 
I think you just had a paint gasm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great so, term. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty but, accurate. But I, we, but we live for those, right? I mean, we, we live for those, those pain chasms. I, I love thinking about it that way. And I, and I feel like it makes all the slogging all the rest of the time, you know, where it's, where it's really hard and we feel like nothing's quite working out the way we, we want it to. And, and, but those, those pain chasm make, make it all worthwhile. I was really interested in that when I read your book, you were, you had your degree in art and you were, you know, kind of starting your career and you talked about having these periods where you just didn't feel like the painting was moving or that it just wasn't, um, you were putting so much pressure on yourself, I think is what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I want, I'd love to hear a little bit about that and how the daily paintings kind of transform that. Well, I should, I should add that Maybe the one thing, one useful thing, no, not useful. One of the things I learned in college was that you're not a real artist unless you're painting really big. I have no idea why. I think that was just maybe what they were doing at the time or what they were telling us at the time. But we also were supposed to be building our own stretchers and stretching our own canvas. And so so every painting I did coming out of college where I should mention that they didn't actually teach us how to paint <laughs> ever, they never showed us any demonstrations on how to paint. They never talked to us about value or composition or anything. I mean, I mean, maybe vaguely once in a while, but nothing that we could actually use. So, so I came out of college with, with no skills on how to paint, but I knew how to stretch a canvas and I knew how to build my own stretcher and I knew that I had to paint big. So I was doing these giant paintings. And so every one that I did was generally really, really frustrating. There were very few that I did during those first, I don't know, let's say three or four years after college that I really liked because, you know, they were all experiments. If somebody had ever said to me, you know, do some studies first or do some small paintings and experiment, that would have changed everything. But Otherwise, but I, I was doing these really big paintings and every time one of them didn't work out, it, it was a, after a huge investment of time and money just to buy all the materials for this giant painting. But, you know, maybe, maybe two days worth of building and stretching the canvas and priming it, getting that completely ready. And then another week or so of doing the actual painting. And by the time it turned out poorly in the end, it was a huge blow to me. I wanted so much for that much time and effort to pay yeah. off, but I was still in a learning phase. So that, that was really, really hard to live with. And so I, I have to admit, and I wrote this in my book that there were days when I would wake up and I would think, well, I can either go in my studio and do another bad painting or I can clean my house. And I had a really clean house for those first <laughs> few years just because <laughs> it was, it was just so depressing to go into my studio. And so, so whenever I discovered daily painting and this idea of, of doing small paintings every day, suddenly this whole new world of possibilities opened up and it was really, I started enjoying painting, which is what I, you know, I should have been enjoying it the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a period of time when it was just, you know, paint bigger. And I, I can, I understand it in the sense that you sometimes changing the scale will sometimes kind of break you out of a fixed way of thinking and make you a little bit you know, like make you see things a little bit different or explore a little bit more where you might not have on a really small scale. But I think that it's dangerous to say that any one form is the key to, you know, artistic salvation in a way, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, and the whole, you know, like stretching your own canvas is, I feel like it can be sort of um, a ritual that is, is really helpful that, you know, kind of brings you into the space and, and all that. However, more often than not, I think it make it gives you so much pressure, you know, because you have invested so much time to make this giant thing and it, it just makes it like 10 times more difficult, I think, than it needs to be. I mean, there's a reason, you know, store-bought canvases and, and store-bought paints are fantastic. You know, you don't have to mix, you know, like grind your pigments and mix your paints. Yeah. Well, and some people love that. Some people, yeah. I talked to, 
you know, a, a lot of artists who, who find that a sort of meditation and they need that as a break from painting. Cause sometimes I mean, you can't paint all the time, you know, you got to take some breaks and, and so they'll use that, you know, they'll go out and, and prime a bunch of panels, you know, and do that all day long. I'd rather do something else, but that that's just a personal choice. Yeah. You know, I'd rather work on a quilt, which is equally boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think know, the we difference, all have our things. Yeah, yeah. And I think the difference is, is, is it sounds to me like, like feeling obligated to do it versus doing it out of choice and out of, you know, making it sort of a meditative thing. And, you know, they're, they're both valid. Everybody's got to, got to find their own path. Yeah. It's just a matter of, of trying enough things and, and figuring out what your path is. And so whenever you find a path that works for you, you get sort of, I mean, we tend to <laughs> scream it to the world and say, look, this is what worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you too. Right. So that's, that's all I'm doing. So tell me um, a little bit about your daily painting habit. What Do you have a routine that you follow or um, is it just that you know you're going to paint every day? I, I actually used to just go into my studio every day and, and, and it sort of, so what, the way it happened, I'll just give you a short summary was I started painting, uh, when my son was one and a half and he was at the time taking these long naps. And so I would go into my studio, um, while he was napping and that was the only time I had, but I, but I had that every single day. And so it was enough for me to do at least one small painting. Um, during that time. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted more. And so I started hiring someone to come and watch Jacob, you know, for, I think it was every other day, something like that. And then, and then my husband lost his job and uh, suddenly he was available full time. And so he started watching Jacob, I think from, from when he was four, he started watching Jacob full time until Jacob went to school. And that was, that was great, but I tend to be kind of a workaholic. And so what happened was I would go into my studio and I would paint all day, every day. And, and I, after a few years of that, I got, I got kind of burnt out with it because I was Mm -hmm. painting too much, Mm -hmm. but, but I didn't realize it, (laughs) even though I was making me really unhappy. I didn't realize it was that particularly, but I was, and, and I expected myself to be in the studio, you know, as much as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, I I found that I had to really pull back. So now, uh, and this is what, eight years into it. Now what I do is I don't paint unless I want to. And most of the time I I do want to. But if if I wake up in the morning and I'm just not feeling inspired or I just don't have a new idea yet or, you know, whatever, then then I just, I find something else to do. I go for a hike with my family or I, you know, go to the thrift store and look for new stuff or clothes or I, you know, just I work on a quilt or whatever. And then usually what happens is I I get re-inspired and I go back in, you know, after a few days or less sometimes. But but I give myself that and that has really been the key to for for me getting getting kind of permanently unstuck cuz i was really stuck for a while like i got to this really bad point where i didn't even want to i didn't want to pick up i didn't want to look at a paintbrush i didn't want to think if i thought about a paintbrush i i i cried um which is really awful and i <laughs> i even thought about changing careers but it just took some time some time away and then and then just this promise to myself that i was never going to paint if i didn't feel like it and that that's sort of been really big for me um so so my schedule now is is very flexible but i'll tell you a generally what a what a kind of a week looks like for me is i'll spend probably 3 or 4 days out of that week in my studio the whole time you know doing whatever paintings i feel like doing for that day small ones big ones whatever and then I'll spend the rest of the week, you know, hanging out with family and doing other things. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of a, you know, gives you a pretty good idea of my schedule. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious about that time when you, you know, you said you were kind of like the workaholic, you know, in your studio constantly. I definitely can relate to that one. And then you, you kind of came to this realization. Do you remember, like what that was like for you. I mean, I know you said that you were not wanting to pick up a paintbrush and all that, but it sounds like you kind of figured out that you needed something else besides painting. So, you know, some other way to breathe and and get, get away from it a little bit. But I'm curious, you know, going from that really hard core 
it sounds like schedule into uh, something that was a lot more flexible. Did you have a hard time maintaining? This is going to sound like a weird question, but did you have a hard time maintaining a flexible schedule? That's not a weird question at all. <laughs> I, I, yes, it was very hard. I don't know if it's how I was raised necessarily or just my personality, but I tend towards being very scheduled and I tend towards just being a really hard worker and putting everything I have into something. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really hard for me. It took about, I think, two years to finally give myself that gift and of, of only painting when I felt like it and, and realizing that it, it was better. It was better. I had to convince myself and I had to, in order to, to convince myself, I went and talked to a bunch of people about it. I asked all of my friends, you know, how do you feel about this? How do you do it? You know, and at first I, I felt like I was a spoiled princess. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I, I talked about it to people. I said, I know it seems like I must be so indulgent, you know, in myself. And I, I'm just like this spoiled brat, but this is what, I think this is what I have to do. I think this is what I have to do. Try not trying to convince them, trying to convince me. Yeah. And then eventually it kind of sunk in that, yes, this was the only way that as a, as a creative person and with a creative job that I was going to remain mentally sane. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it was quite hard, but I, I did finally convince myself. I don't feel like so much like a spoiled princess anymore. I feel like this is the reality of being a creative person. I feel like I'm kind of going through that transition also and, you know, maybe hopefully kind of near the end of it, not so much at the beginning. But yeah, I mean, like a couple of months ago, I just made the decision, like, I'm going to go do something physical, get outside or go to the gym or do something every day, you know, or three times a week, no matter what. And it was the first, you know, I don't know, couple of months, I f would feel so guilty. I'd be like, oh, this is ridiculous. You need to be working. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. And ta taking time for myself, at least for me, and it sounds like you've got a kind of similar personality, was so hard to consistently do it and not beat myself up for it. Yeah. And, and I think that, that a lot of people have the opposite problem. A lot of, uh, I hear this a lot that people have trouble getting motivated to go into their studio. <laughs> That's not my problem at all. <laughs> Mine's the opposite. I tend to do it too much if I, if I don't watch myself. So I, I, do, I think it's, it's true with this as well, that, you know, we just all have to find the thing that works for us. Some of us need to give ourselves a break and some of us need to, you know, not, some of us need to get out the whip. <laughs> you right, know? Right. So it's just about finding what you need. Yeah. That's really interesting. And the, the idea, the, you know, because that's happened to me that I haven't wanted to go into the studio. And I think it was because I was forcing myself to do something that wasn't, that was because in a way it sounds similar to what you're talking about with the um, canvases. That was because it, was something that I felt like I was supposed to do versus something that I was directing myself to do. And I think that can cause a lot of resistance. We all need to, you know, figure out, you know, all the things that we feel like we should be doing, you know, to really question those things and, and figure out, well, one, is it doing you any good? <laughs> and, and two, there, there's gotta be a reason why you're resistant to it. And, and we all need to, you know, I think if we follow our hearts and do what we love rather than what we think we should be doing for some reason, then we'll be, we'll all be happier. And, and I think an artist that's happy is, is more productive in the end. Mm -hmm. I agree. Tell me about how you kicked off uh, daily paint works. How did that come about? So actually in, at the very beginning, when I was first starting the daily painting after, after I had kind of, you know, gotten into a groove with it and was, was producing and, but still not selling terribly well. I uh, was brainstorming and, and thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a website that where, where, you know, several of us, some good daily painters could, you know, pull their resources, basically show on one website and then all together advertise in a magazine, because I thought that was the only way to advertise back then. And so I, Oh, how did it work? There was this other group and it, it sort of wasn't working out. And so uh, there were 12 artists. And so I thought that was a really good number. And so I kind of redesigned the site and they didn't like it. And so I said, well, then let's, you know, start our own group. It's kind of a sorted tale there. <laughs> really, 
Anyway, I don't want to go into the sordidness of it. But anyway, so Daily Paintworks was born. Um, we had, I think we had eight artists at that point, eight from, from the other group who came over with me or 10 or something. And, and then we juried in a few more so that we had 12. And then we stayed that way for about four years. And we were pooling our money and advertising an American Art Collector. We, we were getting a quarter page ad in an American Art Collector every month. We did that for four years. And, and our stats were going up, but only like we were getting two new viewers a month or something like that. It was really kind of pathetic. And so after a while, my husband said to me, because he was doing the, the work on Daily Paintworks for free and while he was doing his other job. But then he, after he was laid off, you know, we had this conversation about whether we should just drop it altogether or whether we should make it into something bigger and what would that look like. Mm-hmm. And so we decided to expand it and invite more people. And so we, we went through this extensive jurying process where, you know, each month we would jury in you know, five new people or however many. And, and slowly we built up the site until we had about 50 or so people. And then a bunch of stuff happened all at once. The Japanese tsunami happened. And, and at, at the same time, my husband had been working on an auction feature so that I wouldn't have to use eBay anymore. And so that we could offer it or offer that auction feature to the other um, members as well. Mm-hmm. And then, but everybody got really excited about that. And we decided to make a big fundraiser for the Japanese tsunami and use the auction feature and let everybody who wanted to donate. And it was a huge success. And everybody was saying, this is so great. We want access to this all the time. Mm-hmm. And so we decided at that point to go ahead and open up Daily Paintworks to everyone. And we promised those 50 people, those original 50, that they would always be kind of featured. And so those are our featured artists. Mm -hmm. And then we opened up the site. So so now anybody can join um, and they can use the auction feature. And so instead of eBay, they can use our auctions. And then we added a bunch of other uh, features to the site. Like uh, we have a, a weekly challenge. We have a monthly contest. And the monthly contest winners, the top 15 uh, get to be featured for that next month and they get free, you know, free membership for that month. And then, you know, we have several other features that are, I'm totally blanking on them all now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's basically the long story of <laughs> oh, daily pay works. But that must have been, you know, really exciting to be building that and connecting with other artists. Oh yeah. Well, that has been one of the best things about daily painting is this giant community of artists who talk to each other about art and daily painting specifically, you know, how do you ship and how do you do this? And, and, and the sharing of ideas and, and the people are so nice. I tell you, it's so wonderful because, you know, you know, painting can be such a solitary thing. You go in your studio and you're there all day and maybe you're spouse comes home and you say, what do you think? You know, and that's your sole interaction as a human being, you know, unless you go out and, you know, interact with other people too, but daily paint with with daily paint and the blogs, you can post something. And then the next day have all these comments from from people who, who understand what you're struggling with and they can say, Oh, you really nailed it with this one or, you know, or even a suggestion or, or if you ask a question, like I've, I, I can't tell you how much I've learned from just asking a question on my blog. What do you guys think about, you know, edges? And I get tons of, of uh, feedback from people that was more at the beginning, but that network of people has been so wonderful. And I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, a bunch of them in person, just from workshops. And if they're in my area and that, that's just been really wonderful. I, I love that network. That's fantastic. I love it. It's, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's one of the biggest benefits of, you know, the whole internet is that, is that there's, you have all these communities. The thing is, is if you participate often enough, if you're consistent about it, then you develop these friendships with people and you, you get this level of trust where, something like that can happen where people are, you know, freely sharing their ideas and freely, you know, helping each other out. And that's kind of like the, you know, the best side of, of any community. It's really, really cool. 
One thing I am curious about is how are you promoting that? Like what, what is your strategy or do you have a strategy with social media and, and getting your work out there? Right. That seems to be everybody's question <laughs> is, is how are you promoting yourself? And I, I actually have a whole chapter in my book devoted to this mm-hmm. and uh, I have an online tutorial. There are so many things to try. I have a friend who said, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, you're taking all these ideas and you're throwing them up and you're seeing which one sticks. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, that that's the best advice that I've ever heard from, from marketing. Um, you just got to try as many things as you can. And for me personally, the way that I kind of got started and the way I started selling, I got really, really lucky. I think I posted a comment on a blog, an artist blog that I really like, Karen Jurek who you should totally interview. Ooh, okay, what's her, um, she, tell me her name again. Yeah, Karen. Karen, Karen Jurek, K-A-R-I-N-J-U-R-I-C-K. She's, she's a fabulous artist. And she, she saw my comment on her blog and looked at my blog. And I guess really liked it because she wrote to me and she said, I really like your work. I, can I post about it? And I it was just over the moon. I thought, what? <laughs> what a nice person would do this. And I said, mind, you know, I was, thank you so much. And so she did, she posted about my work and within, I think it was overnight, overnight I went from selling, you know, this was at the very beginning and overnight I went from selling maybe, you know, two or three or four paintings a month to selling half of everything I did overnight. Wow. Just because I, I, I yeah, I, I just, I was able to get wished up with her shooting star a little bit. So that was huge for me. But then also, of course, you know, starting Daily Paintworks, that, that was huge. Being a part of that from the very beginning, I think it was really good timing. Also, before that, I was a part of the Daily Painters website. And also, I, I'm big with Facebook and Instagram I, I have love hate relationships with with all social media. Mm-hmm. There are so many ways that they're evil, but <laughs> but they are also the potential for for marketing is huge because you know you can build up this huge network of people that that are your friends online or who like your work. So every time you post, then they all see that, and then they if they they can then share it with their friends and so forth. And so you're you're just being exploded around. The potential for that is there. Mm-hmm. I think that sometimes what gets lost in all of this is that you need to be really proud of your work before you start. Mm-hmm. And I have I have so many students who say, you know, oh, but I, but I've been painting for a year and I'm I'm only selling this number of paintings. And I'm like, wow, you know, you're already selling. That's that's great. Just make sure. You know, and but they're frustrated that they're not selling more. Right. So, you know, make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, because if you're putting a lot of bad work out there, then then you're or subpar work, I should say, then it's just not it's not in your best interest. You you should really be proud of your work first before you start marketing. And I I think people forget, forget that. I I have this analogy in my book and I, I, ever since I thought it up, I am really proud of it. So if you were going to be learning how to play the piano tomorrow, uh, you would expect to have many, many, many hours and weeks and y- a year, years maybe of plunking out bad songs. Practice, basically, you're practicing. Mm-hmm. But you would never think to record those practice sessions, and you certainly would never think to sell those recordings. But essentially, uh-huh. as artists, that's sort of what we're doing. You know, we're we're practicing. And we think, oh, well, I spent a lot of time on this practice painting, and it's not, not that bad, so I'm going to go ahead and sell it. Yeah, I think, I think that that's one of the dangers of, as you're saying, that's sort of like the, da- the one of the flip sides of, of social media is just because you have instant access to, you know, potentially you have instant access to people and you can publish your own work and get it in front of, you know, thousands of people doesn't mean you should. And, um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And also, you know, I think it's just a, a rush to, you know, kind of prove it, prove yourself. I feel like that's another thing that social media has done is it has kind of given people this sort of false sense of, I need to post something fabulous every single day. Absolutely. And it's just, you can't, not every painting you do is going to be great. It's just the reality. I mean, it's a reality for, for people who've been doing it for, you know, 50 years. We all do, you know, subpar work sometimes. I have a, a pile 
a pile of paintings in my studio that, that builds up throughout the year. And then at the end, well, in the spring, I get together with my friends and we have what, what I call a bad art destruction party. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and we all, we all bring our piles of, of bad art and we destroy it because otherwise, you know, we're going to be tempted to one, one, it's going to sit around, you know, making us feel bad every time we look at it, like, oh shit, I did that. <laughs> yeah. But also we're, we, we might be tempted to sell it. So what do you do with all of this? I have a, all these paintings in a pile, and at the end of the year, we or in the spring, we get together and we have this bad art destruction party, and, and it's really fun because we all drink a little wine, and then we take magic markers, and we, you know, if we can't break them in two, which actually we've discovered that mostly we can, <laughs> but we take magic markers and we, we draw all over them, and we point to things with a magic marker and we say oh what was I thinking and you know and just like right all over like what was wrong in it and it makes it this light thing instead of this because it can be this crushing emotional you know oh oh, I did that it's so bad what was I thinking you know (laughs) you feel so bad about yourself (laughs) but but when you write all over it and you're with friends and you're all doing it together it's this wonderful lighthearted affair and and you can just just go to town and get all your frustrations out. And you know, some people, if they've got stretched canvases, take knives and slash the canvases. And then we stick our heads through them and we take pictures <laughs> of ourselves. And it's, <laughs> it's just really fun. And, and like it's so blast. funny. It's really fun. And, and it's so funny because I always post about it. We've only done this twice now. We just have the second annual one. And I post about it on Facebook and on my blog and, and, and I get tons of people, tons of comments saying, oh, what a great idea. I need to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then inevitably I get two or three comments from people saying, what a waste. You know, you're wasting all those, all those old canvases. And no I don't know way. if you, Antrees, have ever tried painting on an old canvas that's already been painted on. I mean, first of all, you know, if you're just painting right on the painting, that's a horrible. I mean, it's oh, what a not fun way to start <laughs> And then if you sand it, you know, you're getting all that stuff in the air. And I just prefer to just throw it away and buy another one because they're really, I mean, in the end, it's it's not worth the frustration just to save that little bit of money. For me, for me, that's my own. That's my right. Own uh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, I would say that there's a, there's a couple things about it. I mean. You know, like I've, I've painted over old ones before and, and sometimes it's interesting. Some, you know, sometimes it leaves like an interesting texture. Other times it just leaves this, you know, like you have, you clearly have something underneath it that doesn't, the brushwork doesn't go at all with what you're doing on top of it. And, and sanding it down does give it a, a completely different texture, but it's not a waste because you spent that time learning something from that painting, even if you didn't realize it. You know, you pro, you failed because you tried something new probably and didn't, and it didn't work out. And you, you eventually figure that out as you keep trying to do that. I mean, the other thing I was thinking when you're telling that, I'm like, okay, so yeah, yeah, you could sand it down and do all that. And then you have to just do it over. But how much time does it take to do that versus like, you know, that's a, it, like what is how much does a canvas cost and what is your time worth if you're going to spend right. you know hours going over a can you know one of those mini canvases it's a buck 50 maybe it's better just to go buy a new one and spend those hours painting that's what i think about it but you know again everyone's got to find their own way so that's I totally respect that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I've, I've had some come out really cool, you know, like stuff that was underneath, let it show through and it comes out really, really cool. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot. Like I kind of just figure this, this is another, you know, experiment and I'm perfectly willing to, you know, let this one not be the greatest painting in the world. So if it comes out, if it turns out well and what's underneath adds to it, then that's fantastic. If it doesn't, I haven't lost anything. You know, I was going to throw it out anyway. Sure. Um, sure. So it's kind of fun to be liberated in that way and just be like, okay, this is a bomb. So it's already it's already a bomb. So I can't make it any worse than it is. Sure. So with all this daily painting that you do, I'm curious, what do you look for in a subject? You're choosing oh my gosh, things. that's a big question. It's <laughs> a very short question, but a very big one. What do I look for in a subject? You know, I think. For just for me personally, I think that the the things the things that I'm attracted to are interesting colors, mm-hmm. um, and the things that I love to play around with are, you know, those colors obviously. And lately, I've been changing some colors 
I haven't really posted about this yet, but I've been changing some colors and, and having fun with that, but also uh, playing around with edges. And, uh, but as far as subjects, you know, it's funny. Some subjects work, work better for this. So for example, I, I get a lot of my stuff from thrift stores. I'm sitting here in my studio actually right now looking at, at my shelves of stuff and I've got all of these, you know, different colored cups and plates and bowls and little glass bottles and pigs and things and vases. <laughs> and, and I just, I love going and collecting them, you know, and I collect them for their shape and for their color, but a lot for their simplicity because, because with my style of painting, I, I'm sort of a blocky painter, fairly loose and, and my paintings the the subjects that lend themselves to that are are sort of simple shapes mm-hmm. and i had it's it's funny i was talking about this community of artists and and loving the the back and forth and everything and and the comments um but every once in a while i get a comment from somebody with an opinion that isn't very nice um mm-hmm. and it's unfortunate that they feel like they have to write to me but <laughs> um but I had this one woman write to me a, a while ago and say, you know, when are you going to serious and start, you know, surely you can afford now to buy some still life subjects that aren't like the cheap, <laughs> the cheap wow. first store stuff. You know, go buy some pewter spoons and China, fancy China. And, and that's not what I want to paint at all. I, I love the simple stuff. I love the cheap stuff. But, you know, <laughs> it's just funny. You know, everybody has an opinion. Yeah, and and uh, and everyone is is free to express it. Yeah, <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> I was oh gosh, I was talking to somebody recently about this. That the thing that I see has happened since the internet is is or I'm not since the internet since social media is that people feel like they. I think it's because you know you're kind of anonymous. You don't have to look somebody in the face and say that. You know what I mean? Like, in mm-hmm. order to get that message to you, she can be rel- She can do it from a distance. She can throw her darts from a distance, and it's really. I mean, I th- like when you when you're saying that. I was thinking it was so much more of a commentary on her than it is on you and anything that you're doing. And it it just kind of like goes to show that it doesn't matter what you do. Somebody somewhere will find a reason to criticize or complain. You know, I mean, you could, you yep. could find the cure to cancer and somebody will find a reason why, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. It's true. You can't have everybody like you all the time. And the more of a public persona you have, the more you're going to get those people telling you, you know, and if the, whatever it is, they don't like it. It's funny because whenever I post something different than what I usually do, I get lots of encouragement, but inevitably I get somebody who says, oh, this new stuff is terrible. You know, you need to go back to the old stuff. That's what you're good at. <laughs> and then I get another comment saying, oh, this new stuff is so great. I'm so glad you're not doing that old crap anymore. <laughs> oh, my God. See? Like, wow, I can't make anybody happy. Except I am, you know. And it's well, if you make yourself whenever happy. I, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and I get tons and tons and tons of emails saying oh just you know so happy with what you're doing whatever that and that's wonderful and I hate the fact that it's the two that I get saying you know not so great but those are the ones I remember I hate that but that I I think that's just human nature it is human it is human nature like you could have a (laughs) hundred there's a saying here in Argentina it's probably everywhere but so in Argentina it's it's the nicknames people use for each other, the most common are either flaca or gorda, um, which either, which is either skinny or fat. And so to the point oh, where, wow. like, yeah, so like that's like, <laughs> it's so common, right? And so like, as an example, if you're in a, a restaurant and you want to get the waiter's attention, they'll usually say, Hey, flaco. And so there's this saying that, you know, like your husband can tell you, 10,000 times, your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, somebody can tell you 10,000 times a day that, that he loves you and you'll forget it. But if he tells you you're fat one time, you'll remember it for the rest of your life. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so I think that it is just human nature that, that we, that one thing, it stings for whatever reason, but yeah, and I get them too. Like I've, I've had comments about, you know, lots of stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I don't know. Like, I think that I just, I, I think that I kind of just came to this opinion that, that it doesn't matter what you do. Somebody will, somebody somewhere will find fault. Then that's, that's fine. I'm sure that, you know, 
whatever i've i've criticized people before maybe i I shouldn't have but i guess i just kind of look at it like yeah okay it's fine you know like that it it if you look at the perspective that they're coming from, I feel like oftentimes they're just really frustrated with something that's going on with themselves. And, you know, like maybe that person loves the way you paint and is sort of like vicariously living through you, through your paintings and wish, you know what I mean? Like you see somebody who paints really well and you're like, oh my God, I wish I could paint like that and watching and you're posting it every day. And so there's a sort of personality that comes out. And so I think they kind of get this feeling like they're, I don't know, it's it's kind of hard to describe, but it's kind of like, you know, with television programs or, you know, like stories that you want it to go a certain way. And when it doesn't, you get frustrated because you, you develop this sort of like emotional attachment to it that's not actually kind of accurate. I don't know if that makes sure. any sense at all, but <laughs> that's what no, I'm absolutely. thinking. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's funny sometimes. Um, my husband gets into celebrities a little bit more than I do, like, you know, television stuff. Mm-hmm. And he'll read some of the stuff online about, oh, what the celebrity did and, you know, who the celebrity married and that sort of stuff. And, you know, and sometimes he'll come to me and he'll be like, yeah, I heard that so and so said this. I didn't, I didn't think he was like that. <laughs> I'm like, how do you think you know? <laughs> exactly. you know? You're just watching this character. You're watching a character in a show, and suddenly you feel like you know this actor? <laughs> but I think that is also human nature. I mean, we do. We, and and we do, I'm sure we do the same thing with artists. I know I do. You know, I see somebody. I'm a, it's been really interesting for me to listen to the interviews that you've done with some of my favorite artists to hear, you know, what they have to say and what their personality is like. I found that really interesting because yeah. I just, from looking at their work, I, I got a sense that they were a certain way. Mm-hmm. And then I've been surprised to hear what they're really like, you know, and then who knows how much an interview really shows what they're really like. But, you know, it it shows me more than anything I've known before, you know. Yeah, yeah. Who was I talking to about this? I was talking to somebody and they were saying, um, Oh, you know what we were talking about? It was in one of the interviews. I think it was Carolyn Lord who said this. But she was talking, we were talking about the gallery artist relationship. And she, I hope it was Carolyn Lord, but we'll just say it's this person that I was talking to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put words in her mouth if she didn't say it. But it was a really interesting comment that some collectors don't want to know an artist because they respond so strongly to their work and they're worried that they won't like that that if they meet the person, then they won't like them and then they won't be able to like look at their work the same way again, which I thought was a really Very interesting, interesting. conversation. So, I can see that. I can totally see that. Yeah, I had, I did have that one time in my life. I was, when I was a kid, I was a huge, huge fan of the monkeys. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I met one Me of them. <laughs> I was huge. Like, I had like these like old albums that I found at garage sales and I would listen to the monkeys or whatever. And then one time I will say, one time I met one of them and he wasn't nice. And uh, that was it. No more monkeys. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> That's so funny. Anyway, sorry. I'm totally digressing and getting too chatty. Uh, yeah, one of the monkeys broke my heart. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So I like to I like to ask this because it's it's partly um, a little bit selfish, but do you do you have a fam- favorite documentary or biography of, of an artist that you no, would recommend? I, I don't. I'm... I'm terrible. I I haven't read very many biographies of artists or seen very many documentaries. I think lately I've been really getting into podcasts, <laughs> listening to interviews with artists. And so far, my favorite, I can't remember if it was you, Peggy Carl Roberts. Have you interviewed Peggy mm-hmm. Carl Roberts? Mm-hmm. Whatever one I listened to, it was just so great. She just is an amazing person. And I, I liked uh, everything she had to say. So I would have to say her, although before that, I guess uh, the only um, sort of biography I've read uh, that I've read is uh, John Singer Sargent. And he's, of course, a huge, huge hero of mine. So between the two of them, I guess that's about it. Yeah. What do you remember the title of the John Singer Sargent biography or was it? I have read a couple of books. I did, and this isn't so much a biography, but it does have a lot of information about him. I, I read that strapless book that's all about the controversy with, you know, Mad- that Madame X painting and all mm-hmm. that, which was really interesting. And then I had one forever ago that, that was just 
you know, it was a lot of his paintings. It was a big book. I bought it during college. It was the first book, art book I ever bought. And, and it was when I was really poor and it was $50, this oh, book, which yeah. was huge for me. But I loved his work and I wanted to just have it in my hands, you know, and access to it all the time. I didn't want to check it out of the library. I wanted to just have it. And so I read, I read some of the, you know, biography stuff in there and it wasn't terribly captivating. It was just facts and stuff, but, but I just, and I mostly looked at the pictures, but that's me. You know, I, I look at pictures. <laughs> I can't help myself. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a magazine and I'll just flip through looking at all the pictures. I won't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> That's funny. Do you have a particular habit or or strategy that you feel like has greatly contributed to your success? Well, I I think I hate to like toe my own party line, but but painting often mm-hmm. as often as I can, and and painting small in addition to large, but painting a lot of small paintings, I, I think has been huge for me. Uh, I think you can learn as much about composition with a small painting as you can with a large painting. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I feel like that, that was my biggest hurdle. I think before I started doing the daily painting was composition. I feel like I had a pretty good hold on other things, but that one was huge for me. I I wasn't very good at it. And so just doing tons and tons and tons and tons of small paintings. I think I'm on what 2090 is is the number I hit yesterday. And I think that that has been huge for me for composition. I, I feel like I have a really good handle on it now. But also the thing I said earlier about about not painting if I didn't feel like it. And and, and the biggest thing about that is not, feeling, not painting if I'm not inspired. Mm. You know, if I get up in the morning and I, I just can't, I, I just can't think of any new ideas or, or anything. Nothing is really compelling me. Nothing's calling to me to paint it then I just won't. And that, that has really saved my sanity. So, so those things have been huge. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I just want to, you know, like, it's, it's kind of worth repeating, like that that's 2000, 2000 paintings that you're talking about. Um, right. Which is, and that enormous. doesn't count all the paintings I've done. That's just, that's just the daily paintings that I post on my blog. 2000, not including the ones that, that suffered the, uh, the knife. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the better <laughs> destruction party. No, those aren't counted. And also demos at workshops have not been counted, of which there have been a lot. So I've done 64 workshops. And at each of those, I did, you know, anywhere from three to five demo paintings. So there's that. And then also, uh, I didn't count a lot of my larger paintings. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I didn't count anything before eight years ago. So I'm sure I've done more like three to 4,000. But just just counting the daily paintings, that's, that's how many there are. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, so, you know, you're mentioning this, I think it's really easy for people to feel like they're not progressing or to look at somebody that might be a little bit more established and be like, Oh my God, you know, like get down on themselves for not being able to, to paint like that. So I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of recognizing the, the miles of canvas that that you've gone through is really, is really important. And, and actually, just, I mean, I would say not comparing yourself to anyone other than your own paintings, you know? Yeah, and, and I that's that's also human nature. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I do that, too. Oh, I, yeah. I look on Pinterest, and I see all these great artists doing amazing things, and I just, I have a tendency to beat myself up about it. But then I, I remember, you know, okay, you know, I'm a human being. <laughs> right. And, you know, I just keep going. And yeah, I think it is important not to compare ourselves to those people too much because, I mean, get inspired by them, certainly, exactly. but yeah, if we compare ourselves, yeah, it can be really heart-wrenching. Well, Carol, thank you so much for being on the show with me and spending the time talking with me. It was really interesting and really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for having me on. It was, it was really lovely. great takeaways from this episode. I'm inspired. Do you have a daily painting habit? I would love to hear how it has changed your paintings. Go to SavvyPainter.com and share what you've learned in the comments section. And check out the show notes for this episode along with Carol's paintings there. And by the way, if you missed that episode with Dwayne Kaiser, don't let it happen again. Sign up for show notes and free guides at SavvyPainter.com. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.